Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. My, what a wonderful song. How many of you thankful the Lord came to you? Amen. May we never forget that. And I'll never forget Bruce Fry, a, a songwriter, a wonderful Christian man. His brother said, I heard you found the Lord. He said, no, he wasn't lost. I was lost. He found me. May we never forget that. Thank you. That was wonderful. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew chapter 5. Here we are to celebrate Memorial Day, and what a privilege and an honor it is to get to do that. Don't ever forget what Memorial Day is about. It's where we preserve the memory of a person or an event. Now, God sets some memorials. You realize in the Old Testament, when they put the blood over the lentil, the Lord said as a memorial, I want you to do a feast every year in remembrance of this, a memorial. You remember when the children of Israel were going into the promised land. God said, I want you to take some of the stones and put them there for a memorial to be remembered. In our nation, when you go to our capital, we've got memorials everywhere. We've got the, the Washington Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial. And it's there to bring a remembrance so that something isn't forgotten. I was invited over a wonderful family's house for Sunday dinner after church. And as we walked in the house, Boy, there's just something about turkey and dressing and mashed potatoes that created an aroma that's seductive. How many of you all understand that, right? And as we walked in the house, they're going to serve us this wonderful Sunday meal. And boy, I'm just breathing this in. And, and I'm one of these guys, I can gain weight breathing the food. I don't even have to eat it. Just breathe it. And I'm looking forward to this time. And we walked into the dining room. And the pastor was there and his wife and our host was there. And the uh, pastor said, Brother Gibbs, why don't you sit here? And I said, okay. So I took a chair there. And a lady came in with a huge platter of food. She was our hostess, the mother. And when she saw me in that chair, things changed. Her lip began to tremble. And tears started coming down her cheek. And she said, Brother Gibbs, as a favor to me, please don't sit there. That's Tim's chair. Our boy, just not quite a year ago, gave his life on the battlefield for America. He was blown to pieces when he rushed and put his body down to protect others. And she said, that's where he always sat. And she looked at me and she said, I had no idea liberty was so expensive. I had no idea how liberty could hurt. She said, I'm so proud of my son. That's what Memorial Day is about. It's remembering the Gold Star moms. Oh, I love the hot dogs and the celebration and the fireworks if they have them. But we ask young men and women to give their lives for something for certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And on this day, we take a moment and we celebrate that. I'll never forget the tone in that mom's voice. I've thought of her a thousand times since. By the grace of God, may we never forget what we have here is not an accident. People paid a great price. Yes. 
a great price. God's called us to be a memorial, every one of us. And the devil's got a master strategy in America. And if you only hear one thing this morning, please hear this. The devil just wants you and me distracted from what God called us to do. That's his game plan. Just to get us distracted, get us busy. Forgetting what it is we're supposed to be doing. I love the passion of your pastor. I love being with him. I love watching him witness to people. I love the passion of his heart. And that's touched and changed me. It's changed my family. But our nation is in dire trouble right now because I'm failing at some things. And as I go nationwide, I'm watching God's people fail at it. Listen to what the scripture says from the lips of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. Now, please note, if you're a child of God, and how many of you here know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Then you are the salt of the earth. But Brother Gibbs, I, I don't want to be the salt of the earth. No, no, no. By declaration of God, we are the salt of the earth. That's what we are. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith it shall it be salted? It should be henceforth, and then come some frightening words. Good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. I wonder how many good-for-nothing Christians we have here today. I wonder how many days, sadly, Brother Gibbs has been a not-salty Christian, a good-for-nothing Christian. Now, we can fool each other, but none of us fool God. And God knows the recesses of our heart. My family was in the cattle slaughtering business. And when we would slaughter all those animals, one of the things that we would get from them are hides. There's a lot of money in cow hides. They go into all kinds of leather goods. But our family would store thousands of them every week of these cow hides. And then we'd wait for the hide buyers to come, the people that bid on them and buy them. And how we kept them without spoiling was we'd lay a hide down with salt and a hide and salt and salt and a hide. Because without the salt, the hides rot. They don't preserve. The salt has to be there in order to keep it. And so we'd have thousands of hides in these warehouses all salted down. And one day my grandfather said, come on with me, we've got a problem. And we walked into one of these huge warehouses and there was a stench and an aroma in the air that left the taste in your mouth for days. Have you ever smelled something so decayed, so putrid that you walk out and you're, you say, mm, boy, that tastes terrible. Wow, just the smell of it. And I said, Grandpa, what's the matter? He said, bad salt. He said, we did everything we were supposed to do. Hide salt, hide salt, hide salt. But the salt didn't do its job. And he said, when the hide doesn't get the salt, and the salt doesn't do its job, then you can't stop the decay, son. Everything rots. Well, how in the world do we expand and explain what's happening in America, Pastor? Well, God says, I've put you here as a remembrance of salt. I want you to be my marker here in this society. But if the salt has lost its savor, then the Bible says it becomes good for nothing except to be trodden under the feet of man. Now I want you to look very closely this morning at five keys to that salt. You already know them probably by heart. They're found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 
verse 14. This is a verse that we do songs on, that we teach kids, and it's a great verse. Because God says if you and I will do five things, we'll hear from heaven. And if we're going to have something happen in our nation, here's the marker. This is what we're to remember. Let me just read the verse. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The only hope America has right now, with due respect, is not in the next election. And I sure hope we get some better people in office. But that's not the hope of America. The hope of America is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the hope of America is the local church. I tell everybody, you want to do something for America, go to your pastor and say, please give me something to do. Get active in your local church. Yeah, but, but if I go to Brother Wilkerson and say, please give me something to do, he'll give me something to do. That's why it's so critical that we do it. Now, I want you to look at the five things in this verse this morning. And I want to ask you this question. Are you God's memorial? Are you the salt we're called to be? Am I? Let's look at them. Here's number one. It says, if my people, number one, which are called by my name, Please note, it doesn't say who call themselves by my name. It says who are called by my name. Can you say by the grace of God, the way I live, the way I act, the way I deport myself, the way I dress, the way I talk, the way I do things, people say that's got to be a child of God. If my people which are called by my name. Doesn't matter where you go in America, it's sometimes hard to figure out who the Christians are. Because the world has so tugged and pulled and gotten God's people in, and now we look more like the world than we did. And God says, stop it. I want you to live in such a way that you are called by my name. I was sitting in an airplane next to a fella, and I'm getting ready to witness to him. I, we normally always carry tracks in our pockets. We want to share them. It's a great ministry on the road. And it got to about an hour into the flight, and a wonderful thing about witnessing on an airplane is once they put on the seatbelt sign, they can't go anywhere. They're, they're caught. So I said to this fella, I said, I've uh, been listening to you and your friend. And I said, I have something here I'd like to share with you. And I held up, and he said, is that a gospel tract? I said, that's what it is, yeah. Oh, he says, I'm a born-again Christian. He said, I know the Lord is my Savior. I'm saved. I said, really? Now, for two and a half hours, they've been telling dirty stories. They've been cussing and drinking. And now, I'd have never guessed. I'd have never called them by his name name. I said, well, I said, well, I'm glad you're saved, but let me give this to you just to be sure. <laughs> and the fellow sitting on the other side who was his friend said, you're a Christian? He got called out by his friend. You know what I'm afraid? We have gotten comfortable being vanilla. Yeah. We have gotten comfortable just folding in. 
And God says, I want you to live and act in such a way that you are called by my name. Called by my name. Now that'll never be an accident. That's salt. That's the marker we have. In all the briefs that we put into courts, all the things that go in, we always clearly put the plan of salvation into all our legal briefs. And people come up to me all the time and say, boy, that, that's offensive. You're, you're, you're telling the judge if he doesn't believe in Jesus, he's not going to heaven. I say, well, that's what the Bible says. Yeah, but maybe you ought to tone that down. I said, we love this judge too much to tone that down. How did you get comfortable toned down? And then we wonder why America got to where it is. This is the day of remembrance. And boy, the first key is we're going to be called by his name. Look at the second key. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Now, I hope you're really good at humbling yourselves because it's a command of God. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And if you have not humbled yourself, there's only the opposite, pride. So you're either full of pride or full of humility, one of the two. And if you've got pride in your life, the Bible says you've got God in opposition to you. People call me all the time and say, boy, I don't know how we got in this mess. And I say, well, you don't have any pride in your life, do you? Because you've got God against you by command of Scripture twice. God says he opposeth the proud. And it was written to the Christians. Hmm. Now, I struggle with this, I have to confess. My problem is, I get ticked off. How many of you here have ever been ticked off? Hold your hand up, would you? Yeah. And then when I get ticked off, I feel led to say something. I feel I was made to say something. This is why I'm on the planet, is to say something. And so I'm going to, mm, my moment, forget humility, here we go. And I've heard people say I was at a loss for words. I've never been at a loss for words. <laughs> and by the way, when you're ticked off, neither have most of you. I just open my mouth and the words are there. They're there. And humility is just gone just gone. I'm getting on an airplane in the early morning hours, and I'm not a morning person. I get up, but I do not like mornings. How many of you, you're like my dear wife, out of bed at 5 a.m.? How many of you, you're a morning person? I ought to be legal to shoot you all, all right? <laughs> mornings were made to be taken with much coffee, much coffee. I'm getting on an airplane, and they put a brand new interior in it. It's a brand new Delta airplane. Beautiful interior, but tiny. And I'm looking at the seats, and I'm thinking, those are the most ridiculously small seats I've ever seen. Once I'm wedged in that seat, I will not need a seat belt. I won't. <laughs> Turn this baby upside down. I won't be going anywhere. I mean, I'm just going to be right there. Well, I walked back by my row, and I'm putting my stuff up overhead. There's people all around us, and there's a flight attendant there. And I didn't say anything about her. I commented on the seat. I said, that's the most puny seat I've ever seen. Puny. She exploded. It's quarter to six in the morning. I said, that's the most puny seat I've ever seen. She said, well, you could lose weight, you know. <laughs> okay, lady, bring it on. <laughs> Humility, 
gone. You want to trade barbs? This is why I'm here. She said, you could lose weight, you know. I said, you're right, and you could get prettier. I said, you're one of those seriously cosmetically challenged people I've ever met. I said, I'll bet your mother didn't even keep the baby pictures, did she? And I feel wonderful. <laughs> when humility is gone, your mouth will roll. When humility is gone, you'll end up saying things you know are not right. Now the people around me are clapping. And a businessman there got his pen out and he said, say that again, I'll write all that down. <laughs> now here's the sad part. I'm his. And I'm here as a remembrance for him. I'm his salt. She teared up a little bit, and I said, well, if you think tears are going to get you something, you're dreaming. I'm putting my coat up overhead, and my track slid out. And I picked him up to put back in, and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, probably not a good time to give her one. Mom, do the kids ever see you unload? How many of you have children? Hold your hand up. How many of you know kids are God's little spies? They are. God says, listen, you're my salt. You got to be called by his name. And you got to humble yourself. Humble yourself. I went back up by that flight attendant and apologized. I told her, what I did to you, I'd never want somebody to do to my wife or daughter. And I said, please don't hold me against this, but take this, please, and read this. Oh, my, read this. What's happened? Called by his name, number one. Humble ourselves, number two. Write number three down. Pray. Such simple things, called by his name, humble ourselves and pray. Isn't it amazing? We'll watch Fox News for a half an hour, an hour, but we have not got time to pray for an hour. And yet the scripture says we're to pray without ceasing. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. What would it take for us to get our prayer line going? I was in a third world country in a meeting with wonderful Christian people, but extremely, extremely impoverished. Pastor, we were the only people there with shoes on. The people didn't have money for shoes. Several ladies came up by me and said something that changed my life. They said, it must be hard for you to pray in America. I said, what now? They said, it must be hard for you to pray in America. I said, why do you say that? They said, because you have everything. I said, I, I don't understand. The one mother stepped up. She said, Brother Gibbs, you understand, if we don't pray, our kids don't eat. If we don't pray, our kids die. There's no medicines. If we don't pray, marauders overrun our village and steal everything. It must be hard for you to pray in America. You have everything. 
the great London preacher Charles Spurgeon said, nothing can destroy Christians like prosperity. And he said, the first thing to die is prayer. Because we have everything. How's your prayer life? Now, I don't mean just a little bit of prayer. We're in dire straits. And the Bible says you have not because you ask not. And God says, ask and ye shall receive. Seven times the Son of God said that. What's on your prayer list for your mate, for your kids? I've shared this many times. I have a prayer list of 62 things that I pray for my bride every day. Nothing peculiar to us. I've shared the list many hundreds of times. But everybody who reads it says, I want all those things, but you're not asking. What would it take for you, my friend, to start to really get fervent in prayer? Number one, called by his name. Number two, humble ourselves. Number three, pray. Look at number four, we're almost done. Seek my face. Hmm. When's the last time you said, Lord, I want you. I want to seek your face. I had my granddaughter on my lap. She's real easy to talk to because She's just a little chatterbox. And if about every five minutes you say, mm, how about that, she's good for another five minutes. <laughs> she's wonderful. But somehow I got distracted and she did something, and parents know this. I wasn't paying attention, and she said, and she reached up and she took my face and pulled it over. When's the last time you went to God and said, I want you. I'm going to seek your face. How do we get comfortable just living, calling on him when we think we need him, but not seeking his face? Now, trust me, if we get a big pain in our chest and go down to the cardiac unit at the hospital this afternoon, and the doctor walks in and says, this looks bad. You'll want to seek his face. Because he's an ever-present help in time of trouble. But he wants us to seek his face at all times. And it's never an accident. I get so wound up with so many things to do, I forget to seek his face. God, I want you. I want you in what I'm doing. But then tie it to the last one and turn from their wicked way. The problem is not in Washington, D.C. It's not in Indianapolis. The problem is with the believers. Amen. If we will turn from our wicked ways. Now you won't have any problem in fooling me today. But nobody's going to fool God. Can you say, I'm good salt. Called by his name. Humble myself. Pray, seek his face, turn from my wicked way. That's what we're called to do. That's the memorial that God puts us here for. Ye are the salt of the earth. And by God's grace, we can be every bit of this. Every bit. We'd had a wonderful church service was in the state of Illinois. 
And a lady came up to me and she said, I just want to thank you for your preaching. I said, oh, well, thank you for the honor. And she said, but I have a question. She said, if someone dies without Christ, is there any second chance? I said, no, ma'am, there's not. That's why it's so pivotal that everybody knows the gospel. This is your chance. She said, my husband died on the battlefield defending America in Vietnam and did not know Christ. And nobody ever handed him a gospel track. We didn't know. She said, what's tragic is our home was on a block with a fundamental Baptist church that had tracks. But nobody ever on our door. You have no idea what's on the other side of that door. And that's why this is so critical. She said, Brother Gibbs, I have scoured the Bible trying to find something. He was a good guy. But he mocked God and he wasn't saved. And she said, now I live with that remembrance. It's Memorial Day. It is time for us to remember we ask young men and women to put their lives in harm's way and defend our liberty. And it's time to remember we're the salt of the earth. We're the ones that are gonna make the difference and if the salt has lost its savor, it's henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of man. This Memorial Day, I beg you, for the sake of our nation, for the sake of our Savior, it is time for us to be the salt, to be the memorial we're supposed to be.